I don't know of many things that will transform our relationships like the God-given ability, the Spirit-empowered ability to control our mouths and restrain our tongues. This ability will help us on the job, in the workplace, in the home, and in our marriages. This week I was reminded of one of the funniest things that has ever happened to me in pastoral preaching ministry. It was several years ago. We were actually in a series of messages about the family, about the home, and we were working toward a marriage retreat, marriage enrichment weekend. And I looked up that Sunday morning, and I saw that Brother Al Funderburk and his precious wife, Miss Margie, Brother Al is now with the Lord, they were seated back here where they would always sit, and they had three or four pews. It it was pack-a-pew day because it was, I believe, their 67th or 68th wedding anniversary and all of the family was in town to celebrate and I just spontaneously asked brother Al and Miss Margie to make their way down to the front and share some words of matrimonial wisdom with God's people I mean they were pushing 70 years of marriage at that time and I asked brother Al I said "Uh, we got limited time so just give us your number one thought. These younger men, and of course they were in their senior years, and so that was most of us, these younger men, uh, these single young men, give us your number one word of wisdom. How do you have a happy, healthy, holy marriage? And I handed him the microphone, and he said, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and that's all he said. And the place erupted with laughter. People were throwing babies from the balcony. It was one of the most hilarious things that I've ever been part of. So I walked around him to Miss Margie, and I said, Miss Margie, there's some younger women and wives here in the church. We've heard Brother Al's wisdom for the husbands. What word of wisdom would you have for the ladies? And she said, you're going to be right as much as you're wrong, wrong as much as you're right, and in both cases, keep your mouth shut. And I mean, it was an electric atmosphere. I I confess to you that I immediately thought I was expecting something a little deeper, (laughs) a, a, a little weightier, a little more spiritual and theological. But the more I've chewed on that, it was deep. It was weighty. It was spiritual. And it was, in fact, theologically sound. For the Bible says elsewhere in Proverbs 21, verse 23, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. That word keep means to guard, to control, to restrain, to watch over, to hold. And what wisdom it would be for the people of God to learn by God's good grace how to build a better mouth trap. Now, this will be somewhat of a topical message, as most studies of the Proverbs are, but I'm going to give you a wealth of Scripture this morning. So you note-takers, get your pen or your pencil ready as we examine three things about building a better mousetrap. Number one, we need to consider the reason for our speech. Now, if you go to the doctor with a fever, they're going to try to get the fever under control, but the wise doctor will also look for the cause of that fever. They understand the fever is but a symptom. Now, the fever is a serious symptom that can, in fact, kill you and bring a lot of greater damage, but the fever is no more than a symptom of the root of the problem. And in the very same way, our words are but a symptom of the greater, deeper problem. Now, like a fever in the body, those words can cause damage and destruction of their own if not brought under control. The symptomatic fever of ungodly words can destroy marriages and businesses. If you've ever done business in a place and the clerk was rude to you, the waitress was unkind to you, the salesman spoke to you in a demeaning way, you've said, I'm never going back in there again as long as that person is working there because those those words can cause damage, but much like a fever in the body, they are but a symptom. So we want to examine for just a moment, what what is the underlying reason for the speech that comes out of our mouth? Three simple things. Note, first of all, the root of our words. The root of our words. Verse 27 says, he who restrains his words has knowledge. One translation says, he who keeps his 
words. He who withholds his words. The idea is that the words did not originate with the tongue. The words did not originate with the lips or any other part of the mouth. But the mouth was designed by God to be that restraining device, that, that, that gate that keeps something enclosed, that leash that keeps some wild beast from getting loose. Well, what in fact is the root of our words? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. In Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, theft, lies, and blasphemy. That is, the heart of the problem is there's a problem down in the heart. And I don't mean to use a, a crude or a gross illustration this morning, but if you've ever taken your baby to the doctor, to the, to the pediatrician, the doctor will want to often will want to know how many diapers does the baby have each day. And again, not to be crude, but what is the number and, well, what is the nature of those diapers? How, how many wet diapers, how many dirty diapers? And that is actually a very important medical fact. The doctor understands that what's coming out of the body is an indication of what's going on on the inside of the body. Even as an adult, if you have certain surgical procedures, the doctor will want to know that you're able to go to the restroom in a safe and healthy way before they release you from the hospital. Because once again, the wise doctor knows that what's going on on the outside is an indication of what's going on on the inside. And the same is true with our words. The reality is when we say sinful words, it's not a mouth problem. When we touch sinful things, it's not a hand problem. When we go to sinful places, it's not a foot problem. When we watch sinful things, it's not an eye problem. And when we listen to sinful things, it's not an ear problem. The Bible says that we need to restrain our words, words that are rooted down in and erupting from the heart. Jesus said, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Solomon said, guard your heart, for out of it flow all the issues of life. Beloved, we should guard our thoughts because thoughts become words and words become actions. Actions become habits. Habits become lifestyles and lifestyles become destinies. And it all started in the heart. Now, the root of the problem is in the heart. That means the remedy has to be in the heart as well. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have an impossible struggle to transform and control your heart. Your only solution is to believe on Jesus Christ by grace through faith, to have your life and heart transformed by one who when he was reviled on the cross did not revile in return. And when he was threatened, he did not threaten in response, but entrusted his own life to the Father who judges all things righteously. The root of our words is the heart. Second main truth connected to this, the revelation from our words. Now, once again, the problem is not in the mouth. The, the mouth is just magnifying and amplifying the real problem. In the very same way, this microphone that I'm using this morning is not preaching this sermon. The microphone is just magnifying and amplifying the sound. How silly would it be for me to think that I would preach a better sermon if I got a better microphone? The, the microphone is just a tool. In the same way, your mouth is just a tool revealing what's going on in your heart. Now, I'm about to confess something to you, and I don't want you to say amen. You had not been amening much up to this point. Don't start right here. But for all of my ministry, I've tried to preach shorter sermons. I try, and I try, and I try, but they always seem to come out right around, how long, Brother Andrew? 44 minutes. 
This past week, I was out in Arkansas preaching to a group of, or speaking to a group of pastors, and they asked me if I would bring a message before I brought kind of a speech to them about our Southern Baptist Convention. I was not prepared that evening to bring a sermon, but I'm always ready to preach. But they just asked for a brief little devotional word, so I decided I'd shorten it up, tighten it up. I saw later the next day, they put it on YouTube. It was 43 minutes and 12 seconds. I figure since they asked for a brief message, there was no reason for me to give them all 44 minutes of a regular sermon. 43, 12 was enough. But I want you to imagine that I'm trying to cut out the length of my sermons. So I take the cord that this microphone uses. It's about three feet long. And imagine that I got some wire snips and cut one foot out of it and spliced the ends back together thinking that that was going to make my sermons one-third shorter. How foolish that would be. You would think that I've lost my mind. It is equally foolish for us to think that we can control our words merely by controlling our mouth. The mouth is not the problem. The problem is down in the heart. And if you want to know where you really stand with Jesus, listen to the words that come out of your mouth. I've got a simple illustration this morning, two little water bottles. This is just a common water bottle, two bottles of water. Uh, put some food coloring in one of these bottles. It's easy to see which bottle contains the food coloring with the dark green, uh, the water with the dark green food coloring. It's easy. Can you not see the difference? The water bottle is clear, and it's just allowing you to see the content of the bottle. Did you know in the very same way your mouth is just like a clear water bottle allowing us to see the content of the heart? 2 Corinthians 13:5 says that we ought to examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith. And if I were doing a spiritual examination and evaluation of my walk with Jesus, there are a lot of places I could look. I could look at my church attendance record and by the way you could too. Psalm 122 verse 1 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I could look at my giving record. The Bible says that, that God loves a cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. I, I could look at how many people I've led to Christ lately because Jesus said, come and follow me and I will make you to be fishers of men. But one way that I can evaluate my walk with the Lord, I'm talking about one way that my Christian maturity can be revealed is with a simple little device, and you've got it right there with you. If you just take your hand and cup it like that and put it up by your face, up by your jaw, so that the words out of your mouth ring a little bit louder into your ear, if you'll listen to the words coming out of your mouth, it will reveal what's going on in the human heart. The revelation from our words, the root of our words. Let's note thirdly, the restraint of our words. Again, verse 27, he who restrains his words has knowledge. Solomon speaks of controlling the mouth and of restraining the lips. To each of my four children, I've had plenty of occasion to tell them, here's what you need to do. Take your top lip and your bottom lip, press them together as hard as you can, and hold it there as long as you can. And that will keep you out of trouble and might keep me out of trouble too. You be in trouble with me, I'll be in trouble with defects if you don't take your top lip <laughs> and your bottom lip and shove them together as hard as you can for as long as you can. He who restrains his lips has knowledge. Years ago when I was on staff here, Don Hathaway was our pastor I was going to a family event, and I knew that there was going to be family drama. Come on, somebody. There's going to be family drama at that weekend event. I said, pray for me that I can control my mouth. I don't want to say anything I don't need to say, make a bad situation worse. Well, the weekend transpired, and Don and I were headed over to Waycross that following Monday, and neither one of us thinking about it, but he said, oh, by the way, I did pray for you all weekend. How did the weekend go at the family event? And I said, it went pretty good, but my tongue is so sore. I've been it all weekend. 
And that's not ridiculing someone with a speech impediment. That was me simply saying it was a good weekend with the family in part because I restrained my words and held my tongue. The problem is we use our lips as a release when we ought to use them as a restraint. We use our mouth like a microphone when we ought to use our lips like a leash and to keep our flesh and our words under control. David prayed this prayer in Psalm 19, 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And by the way, if you don't get the meditations of your heart under control, you'll never have the words of your mouth under control because write this down now, or look at this. You don't have time to write it down. Here's the reason for our speech. An unguarded heart is bent against the Lord, and that sinful heart tries to manifest itself through our lips, and we don't always demonstrate the spiritual maturity to just flat keep our mouth shut. Boys and girls, mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is considered prudent. The reason for our speech. Second main truth, let's examine the result of our sin. What happens when we do not restrain our mouths? And by the way, this is one area of life in which we've all, each and every one, have to say, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If if, If you've ever said something you should not have said, you're in good company. So has everybody else except the Lord Jesus Christ. James said that the tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. That's that's why David prayed in Psalm 141 verse 3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth and keep watch over the door of my lips. The language here is that there's a prisoner inside the mouth. The the, the teeth are a gate (laughs) or, or, or prison bars. But sometimes that prisoner tries to slip past the gate. And so David prays, Lord, would you set a sentinel, set an armed guard outside the the gate of my lips and the door of my mouth. You see, David knew there's a brawler inside my mouth and he wants to get out and hurt people. There's a liar inside my mouth and he wants to get out and deceive people. There's a critic inside my mouth that wants to get out and bully and, and criticize and ridicule. There's a slanderer inside my mouth that wants to get out and cut people down to size. Why, there's even a boaster inside my mouth that wants to get out and rave and brag and demonstrate pride. God, don't let him out. Someone said that the tongue is so dangerous, God put it behind an ivory wall, and it's so hot, he bathes it in a pool of saliva. I don't know who said that, but I do know who said this. God is the one who said our tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And if we don't get it under control, it's going to result in sin. Uh, What kind of sin? Well, just three simple things. There's much more we could say, but, but first there'll be words that aren't honest. Words that are not honest. Again, this is an area in which we have all failed and fallen short. Well, I'm just talking about lying. And we lie in a variety of ways. We can lie by innuendo, suggestion, insinuation. I was reminded recently of the story of a seminary professor. He said when, <laughs> when he was a young seminary student, he was working a part-time job and didn't want to go back to work after his lunch break. So he got his wife to make him a sandwich, said, bring it in there to the bedroom. She brought it to him. He was laying in the bed. He took that sandwich and threw it up into the ceiling fan, reached over with the phone, called work, and said, I can't go back in this afternoon. I'm flat on my back in the bed, and I just threw up my lunch. (laughs) What he said was true, but it was not the truth. Now, we may not do it that humorously, but let's be honest. We often 
stretch the truth and shade the truth by suggestion and insinuation. One person rightly noted that the truth doesn't grow very well in the shade. Proverbs 12, twenty-two twelve says that lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but lips which speak truth are the Father's delight. Now, there are a lot of things that I love to hear my kids say. I really like to hear them say, Daddy, I love you. I like to hear them say, yes, sir, no, sir, please, thank you. But do you know what your heavenly Father likes to hear from you? Among other things, he delights in hearing the truth. And when we do not deal with the problem in our heart, it will result in us speaking words that are not honest. Secondly, it will result in words that are not holy. You know, you and I can sin with our eyes and our ears. We can sin with our hands and our feet. But I don't know if there's a a more prevalent way that we sin than when we sin with our mouth. When I was serving as chaplain for the Pierce County football team, very often in frustration and anger, those boys would just let them fly. And they would often turn around and see me standing there. And every time they'd see me standing there, without exception, they'd say, oh, sorry, preacher. Sorry, Pastor Mike. I don't normally talk like that. I'm like, liar, liar, pants on fire. But friend, if you're more concerned that the pastor heard what you said than that the master heard what you said, You've got way too high a view of me and way too low a view of God. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. One translation says, Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. Do, Do you use words that you know you ought not use? Words you'd be embarrassed of if the preacher or a staff member or a Sunday school teacher were there. You say, well, I just can't control it. Yes, you can. Until very recently, I've been, in, I've been in ministry well over 25 years, most of it right here. And until very recently, I've never had anybody cuss in my office. You can control foul language. But what about some other ways in which we say words that are not holy? How about bullying? Now, this is not limited to young people, but but boys and girls and teenagers, could I ask you? Do you use words that criticize your classmates? Do you talk about them on the bus or on the playground? Do you pick on them? Maybe that little girl is overweight. Maybe that little boy is not as strong as everybody else. Maybe, maybe he can't throw the football as well as everybody else. Maybe, maybe he can't kick the kickball as far as everybody else. Maybe that teenage girl doesn't have what you think is the nicest figure. Maybe that teenage boy's face has a lot of acne. Maybe in some way they don't fit in. Did you know God takes it very seriously what you say about and how you talk to and talk about someone that he created in his own image. We should be very, very careful what we say to or about anybody, particularly because of their talent, their ability, the way that they, the way that they look. Let no unwholesome word come out of our mouth. We should not be involved in bullying. How about racial slurs? Do you use words that you know do not honor God and don't honor your fellow man? This is especially true for older people in this culture. I've had, I've had devout Christians say to me, Preacher, you just don't know. That's how we were raised. That's our heritage. That's, a, that's just what I grew up saying. Listen to me, friend. You and I have no freedom as a blood-bought child of the living God to base our mouth and the words we use on our culture, our heritage, our tradition, or our upbringing when the The Word of God says, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. And with the same tongue, you bless God and curse men created in the image of God. Brothers and sisters, these things ought not be. 
When we do not deal with the problem of the heart, it overflows from the mouth with words that aren't honest and words that aren't holy. And by the way, in this technological day, I think this instruction applies to the use of social media, to Snapchats and Instagram posts and Facebook posts and tweets on Twitter, text messages and emails. Do you honor God with your mouth? Could I say it like this? Do you honor God with your thumbs? Words that aren't honest. Words that are not holy. Thirdly, words that are not helpful. Bottom line is it's something that didn't need to be said, didn't need to be texted, didn't need to be posted. It just did not need to be said. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, that every idle word, that word idle means that which is unnecessary, didn't have to be said, didn't need to be said. But for every idle word that men shall speak will give an account on the day of judgment. Wow. I think if we would understand and embrace that truth alone, every person in the building, we'd talk a lot less than we do. Our phones give us instant access to communicate, and sometimes that can be a very devilish thing. Words that are not helpful. Proverbs 15.1 says that a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh answer stirs up anger. Sometimes it's not helpful because of the content of it. It didn't need to be said, and sometimes it's the way that we said it. We said it very loudly. We said it very brashly. We said it in a hurtful tone. I couldn't begin to count the number of times people have said to me, it's not what you said, but it's how you said it. And sometimes they really didn't like what I said, but they don't want to admit it. But sometimes they just told the truth. It wasn't the content. It was the packaging. And it just wasn't helpful. Proverbs 18.6 says that a fool's lips walk into a fight. And his mouth invites a beating. You say, that guy, he's a fighter. He leads with his right hook. No, he probably leads with his mouth. My mother used to say, son, you're cruising for a bruising. How about this phrase? You're asking for it. Oftentimes, that's a literal truth. You're asking for something with your mouth that your backside doesn't really want to have. But a fool's lips walk into a fight. It's your mouth that's going to get you into trouble. Your mouth will invite a beating. Words that are not honest or they're not holy. Words that are not helpful. And I'll be very candid with you. Avoiding these things do not come naturally for me. I need some supernatural help. I need the help of God himself to close my mouth and restrain my lips. I've shared with you before that when I was in the third grade, we spent some time watching the Disney movie Mary Poppins. That's when I was introduced to that big long word, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. It was a bonus spelling word. And so Mrs. Joyce Williams wrote it out in in chalk, took up the whole chalkboard writing out supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. But I memorized that word, how to spell that word, because I wanted extra points on the test. But that was one of the hardest words that I ever learned to say. But, but I've grown old enough now to know there's something harder to say than supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, and that's when you try to say nothing. The country singer Keith Whitley was talking about something else, but he was dead on when he said that you say it best when you say nothing at all. There have been times in my life that I have sinned by failing to say something I should have, but that pales in comparison to the number of times I've sinned when I said something and should have just kept my mouth shut. He who restrains his words has knowledge, and even a fool when he keeps silent is considered wise. So we see this morning three simple things, the reason for our speech, the result of our sin, thirdly, finally, the remedy for our soul. 
I've tried to make this sermon sort of like a trip to the doctor's office. We, we've looked at the root of the problem, these, uh, what's really causing these symptoms. In our second point, we talked about what will happen if it goes untreated. I mean, if you don't deal with the problem, this is what's going to continue to happen. Now, I just want to give you a biblical prescription. Is there a remedy? And the answer is absolutely there is. The remedy is stated negatively in Proverbs 18, 7. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. Notice that his lips are not just a snare for his life, not just a snare for his career, not just a snare for his marriage. All of those things are true as well. But those lips can be a snare for the soul. So I'm just a simple-minded preacher. If the lips can be a snare for the soul, then restrained lips ought to be a remedy for the soul. Now, I could give you a lot of different words of counsel and instruction, but I want to limit our discussion to three simple things. First of all, we need to speak thoughtfully. Thoughtfully. Put your brain in gear before you put your mouth in motion. Daughter, son, think before you speak. Everything that comes to your mind doesn't have to fall out of your mouth. By the way, that's just good social maturity. Even for those that are not followers of Christ. Think before you speak. You've heard it said that God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. And it may be that we are to listen twice as much as we are to speak. Proverbs 13, 3 says, Those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Now, the word rashly here is not talking about the the type of the speech or the tone of the speech. It's talking about the timing of the speech. Rashly in this context doesn't have anything to do with what you said or even how you said it. It really deals with when you said it. Did, Did you just immediately have a response? Are you always popping off at the mouth? Are you never at a loss for something to say? I mean, if you've always got something to say, maybe you shouldn't speak thoughtfully. This has led to the little acrostics, think before you speak, T-H-I-N-K. Five questions we ought to ask. Is it T-H-I-N-K? Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? By the way, the Bible says that we're to speak the truth in love, and our words should be seasoned with salt for the edification of the hearer. That is, the words we say should be for the benefit of the person listening. Have you ever heard someone say, I just had to get a load off my mind? Boy, now that I got that off my chest, I feel so much better now. The question for the child of God is not, do you feel better now that you've said it, but does the person feel better now that they've heard it? We're not to pop off at the mouth for our own benefit. But the Bible says we're to speak the truth in love and our words be seasoned with salt for the benefit, the edification, the profit of the hearer. So is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Could the world have gone on just as well without you opening your mouth and saying that? (laughs) And certainly is it kind? Jesus Christ was full of mercy and compassion. At times he spoke bluntly and confrontationally. Oh, yes, he did. But he was always the very embodiment and the essence of kindness. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should take out a pen and write those five questions or those five words on the palm of your hand and never say anything until you've thought that through. Honey, what would you like for lunch today? Well, let me think. Is it true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, and kind? I'm not suggesting that, but I am suggesting this. If you'll get in the habit of going through those kinds of questions, it will help you. And here's my point. You cannot go through that kind of list in an instant. It takes some time. It may take just a moment. It may take five minutes. It might even take an entire day or more. But speak thoughtfully. You've heard the expression that timing is everything, and that is certainly true in communication. And sometimes when it comes to the timing of talking, sometimes the best time is later. 
Proverbs 20, verse 3 says, It is an honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. Sometimes the most honorable thing you can do is verbally, sometimes literally, walk away from a fuss that's about to break out. You don't have to attend every argument you get invited to. You can send a no RSVP. You don't have to go to every fight you get asked to come to. It is an honor, the Bible says, to avoid strife. But every fool is quick to quarrel. Have you known people that would fuss and gripe and moan and bellyache at the drop of a hat and they'd bring a hat and drop it? There are some people, if you started an argument and dropped a handkerchief at the same time, they'd be on the third point of their dispute before the handkerchief hit the floor. Quick to quarrel. You can't be quick to quarrel and speak thoughtfully at the same time. Proverbs 29, verse 20. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? Notice again, this has nothing to do with what he's saying. has nothing to do with the content of her speech, but it's just very hasty. Always saying immediately what comes to mind. Do you see a man? Do you see a woman hasty in their words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. There's a technique, a little device that I use in marriage counseling. I want to share it with you today. I need you to repeat after me. This is a phrase you need to put in your vernacular. I want to be sure that my words are wise. I need to get back to you on that. Sometimes the best thing you can say is, I'm not avoiding the problem. Listen, this is not the silent treatment. This is not somebody that won't engage conflict and resolve issues. But sometimes in that moment, the wisest, most godly thing to say is, I want to be sure that I respond in a way that's wise. I need to get back to you on that. Speak thoughtfully. Secondly, and we're, I'm going to show you this in the Bible, speak infrequently. Again, if you've always got something to say, maybe you should not. Notice again in verse 27 of our text, Proverbs 17, 27. He who restrains his words has knowledge. Now that verb has may be italicized in your Bible, or it may even be rightly rendered, he who restrains his words knows knowledge. There's a double usage of the word that we find here in the Hebrew of the Old Testament. Somebody who restrains their lips knows knowledge. They understand understanding. What's the first thing you and I need to know about knowledge? We need to know that we don't have all of it. You can't learn anything if you're always the one doing the talking. You can't learn and talk at the same time. By the way, here's a good business principle for you. Here's a good relational principle for you. If you're the one always talking and you're always telling everything that you know, that puts you at a disadvantage because the other people in that business deal, now they know everything that you know plus everything they already knew. Now they know more than you know about that subject, and that's not a position you necessarily want to be in. The Bible says that where words are many, sin is not far behind. Our fallen nature means if we keep talking enough, sooner or later we're going to say something we ought not to have said. Again, Proverbs 18, 2, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. He doesn't want to learn anything. He just wants everybody else to know what he knows. This past week, Andrew and I were traveling with some members of our church, and he's a pilot, and they have a plane. And I was, we were discussing this very principle over supper one night, and I said, I, I'm not a pilot. He's an experienced pilot. Imagine if I were to try to give him lessons on how to land a plane safely and smoothly in a strong crosswind. He would be looking at me like, is this a joke? But have you ever known anybody that was an expert on everything? Bring up any subject and sit back. And they'll entertain you with what they're talking about, what they think they know, like a dog chasing his tail. When I was in high school, there was a popular song. It was a rap song that said, 
You know what your problem is? You talk too much. I said you never shut up. Like a man who was in my office one time and he said, Pastor, his wife said he never wants to listen to me. He said, it's not that I don't want to listen to her. I just don't want to listen to her all the time. Proverbs 26, 20, for the lack of wood, a fire goes out, and where there are no words, quarreling ceases. Some of you in your marriage or other personal relationships, there's this constant arguing that, that goes on. And the Bible uses this illustration. Imagine you've got, a, you've got a fireplace, maybe a fire pit in the yard, or maybe just a place in the ditch where you burn yard trash. And if you keep adding dry pine straw to that fire... You keep putting pine cones on it. You keep putting dry pine limbs and twigs on that fire. You keep doing that, the fire will never go out. And the Bible says in the same way, if you've got a quarrel going on, as long as you keep adding words to it, those words are fuel to the fire. And what you need to do is cut off the fuel source. Close your mouth and restrain your lips. Speak thoughtfully. Speak infrequently. Finally, speak softly. By that, I mean literally, physically. Bring it down a notch or two. Drop it down 10 to 15 decibels. Many of you think that I'm exaggerating when I tell you that Andrea and I have been married almost 26 years, and I can count on three fingers the number of times we've had an argument. Maybe only twice. Now, we've had disagreements. There have been plenty of times I've been wrong. <laughs> By the way, husbands, I just gave you some counsel right there. That's the way you say that. <laughs> but, but we don't argue, and one reason is we don't like to yell at each other. I'm sort of like a preschooler. You know, when you can hear a preschooler, that's not when you need to be worried. It's when you haven't seen them in 15 minutes and you hadn't heard anything out of them. You better go find out what's going on. I can raise my voice when I get angry, but really the angrier that I get, I start speaking more softly. And many of our marriages and other relationships would be benefited if we would just tone it down a notch or two. Again, Proverbs 15, 1, we looked at a moment ago, says that a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh answer stirs up anger. Just speak more softly. I was recently staying in a hotel uh, in Yankee territory. And by the way, a Yankee for me is anything north of the Macon-Dixon line. Anything north of Macon is like a Yankee uh, to me, but, but I, was, I was truly out west and up north. And, and uh, a lady was working in the, the continental breakfast area of that hotel, and she was Little Miss Chipper. And she had this Yankee tone of her voice, and she came in, well, good morning. It's so good to see each of you guys here. What can mama get for you today? Well, you ain't my mama. <laughs> can I get some coffee for you? Would you like some more cream and sugar? I would be so happy to get it for you. Why are you looking so troubled today? You need to smile. Give the world a smile. What can I do for you? I thought you could start by taking it down about 10 notches. I felt a little guilty because she was a great employee. She was trying her best to do her job. She wanted everybody to have a good morning. But she was the embodiment of a caution that is given in Proverbs 27, 14. Do not greet your neighbor loudly in the morning. <laughs> or it will be taken as a curse. Most of us don't like to be awakened by somebody yelling at us. Get up! We like somebody to come in and maybe just gently start stroking our back or rubbing our shoulder. This is just a reminder that sometimes it's just simply too loud to be taken the way you intended it. Speak thoughtfully, infrequently speak softly. In the last year that we have stats from the National Highway Transportation and Safety Board, they tell us that over 22,000 people were killed in automobile accidents on America's highways. And they estimate that more than 2,500 of them, more than 10%, could have survived those crashes except they were not wearing a seatbelt. You see, brothers and sisters, the best restraint is of no use if you don't use it. 
So if you're about to have a verbal accident, let me give you a spiritual seatbelt. He who restrains his lips has knowledge. Even a man with a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. And when he closes his lips, he is considered prudent.